Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Catherine Sievit, Chair of the Department of Landscape Architecture here at Weitzman School of Design. I'm very happy to welcome you to the first of our department's Fall 2023 Now Landscape Lecture Series, and my first is your chair. As we gather here together at Myerson Hall, I'd like to begin with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania is situated upon the ancestral homeland and territory of the Lenni Lenape peoples. As members of an educational community, we are obligated to know the histories of dispossession that have allowed the University of Pennsylvania to grow and thrive on this vibrant terrain. As designers and thinkers, we endeavor to build in ways that lead toward justice, and we are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing consequences of settler colonialism. This fall's Now Landscape Lecture Series has been curated by our very own Sean Burkholder, who serves as the Andrew Gordon Assistant Professor of Landscape Architecture. He's also the co-founder of our Environmental Modeling Lab and the co-author of the recently released book, Five Bay Landscapes, Curious Explorations of the Great Lakes Region. Thanks to Sean's curation, the four speakers whom you'll meet across the course of the fall semester each explore notions of entanglement and the making and unmaking of landscapes, territories, and relationships between humans, plants, animals, and the mineral world. We continually work and rework these commensal and shared territories, and along the way, we are storytelling a kind of tribalography, to quote the brilliant Choctaw scholar Leanne Howe, as she says, telling stories of how to live in our world. This evening, we're delighted to host the extraordinary scholar, Jane Ma Hutton, joining us from the University of Waterloo. This evening's lecture, entitled Material Diasporas, Where Did This Land Go?, is made possible by the Abend Family Fund, which includes two generations of Penn alumni, Steve Abend, Master of Architecture Class of 1965, and his daughter, Linda Abend, freshman, a a 2007 graduate of the College of Arts and Sciences. The fund provides financial support for an annual public lecture on architecture or landscape architecture to students, faculty, alumni, and friends of the Stuart Weitzman School of Design. Mr. Aben attended Penn during the tenure of Dean Holmes Perkins, studying with both Lou Kahn and Ian McHarg. We're delighted that Jane is this year's Aben family lecturer. Her examination of material ecologies or the transformation of materials from production landscapes such as clay pits or quarries to the built environment of design landscapes and buildings has a beautiful resonance with both of Mr. Aben's mentors' own interspecies entanglements, Kahn's conversations with a brick, and McHarg's assertion that we must design literally with nature. Thank you to the Aben family for this gift and to all of you for joining us this evening and especially to Jane for sharing her work with us tonight. And I'd like to now invite Sean Burkholder to the podium to properly introduce us to Professor Jane Ma Hutton. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Um, and welcome everyone to kick off our fall lecture series, uh, again, loosely organized around this theme of entanglement. Entanglement of beings, of materials, of biology, of ideas, of disciplines, um, all in a way that should not surprisingly resemble the complex relationships that we come to understand as landscape. Um, tonight, we're very excited to have Jane Mahutton joining us. Jane is a landscape architect and associate professor at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. Her research focuses on the expanded relationships of the act of building from material flows to labor movements. This work includes examination of the movements of materials as they pass from production, um, like such as quarries and factories, to designed, constructed uh, landscapes and buildings um, through processes of demolition, disposal, or reuse. As a scholar, Jane has published widely. Um, chief among her most uh, chief among them include her recent book, Reciprocal Landscapes, published by Rutledge in 2019. Um, she was also editor of Landscript Five, with its focus on material culture, published by Jovis in 2017, um, and also was a co-editor of the book Wood Urbanism, published by Actar, also in 2020. Um, Jane's research has been awarded the Edra Great Places Book Award in 2020, the Robert and Stephanie Olmsted Fellowship uh, from the McDowell Colony in 2019, and a research fellowship at the Canadian Centre for Architecture also in 2019. 
Uh, in Material as Method, Jane writes, by expanding the conception of landscape to include the materials, beings, and efforts that conspire to form and unform it, we explode the notion of a fixed landscape and see instead a cacophonous network of material relations. She goes on to point out, I'm paraphrasing here a bit, that any close study of these relations as they move through the water, through the earth, through various species, or through the atmosphere, challenge the idea that humans and materials are distinct from one another, and that the world, um, as we human shape, um, we don't shape it alone. As our discipline's preeminent scholar on this complex relationship that we have with the material world of which we are all part, Jane's work serves as an eternal inspiration, um, and we're very excited to have her here today. It is because of her scholarship that we always remember that nothing comes from nowhere, that everything comes from somewhere, and that those somewheres really do matter. So without any further delay, help me in greeting Jane Ma Hutton. That was so, that was a beautiful statement. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so nice to be here. And um, yeah, it's just a real treat for many reasons. And one of them is that I, I feel like I've been kind of like learning from this place and from people that are here. Um, from afar for a really long time on so many different levels. So it's like wonderful to be here um, and thanks for joining. So my plan is to share with you a project that is like very, very fresh. So thank you for joining me on this fresh trip. Um, and um, yeah, it's really a moment to, and I'm hoping just to kind of get feedback. I'm just really trying some ideas out. So bear with me for that and thank you. Um, so for the last, oh yes, and it's, it's called, but probably not going to be called Material Diasporas, um, Where Did the Land Go? That's what I'm, something I'm kind of thinking through. Um, and um, yeah, okay, that's it. So for the last little while I've been writing about the lives of construction materials. Um, in this book that um, Sean just mentioned, Reciprocal Landscapes, um, I looked at these well-known public landscapes in Manhattan and traced specific construction materials back to where they came from. Uh, so even though a two by four in a tropical forest might seem really far apart and unrelated, um, the project was really an exercise in trying to bring them together and observe how those separate landscapes are actually connected. So I was trying to, on the one hand, to see commodities as more than objects, but as part of ecosystems and human livelihoods, and to see how these two different places are actually kind of making each other physically and in many other ways. And then also to see how designers' ideas um, and concepts about environmental protection, for example, map onto the real relationships of what, what's going on there. Um, so in many ways, this project was about um, like at the simplest form was about asking like, hey, where did that come from? Um, but the project that I'm gonna talk about today is a little bit of the opposite of that. Um, so starting with a place, an ecosystem that's been really radically reorganized through colonial capitalist settlement and urbanization. So let's say where, where we all are, or like where I am. I happen to be on the North Shore of Lake Ontario, um, but I think it is kind of, could be anywhere. Um, and just asking like, so this place has changed so much, like where did it come? Where is it now? Or like, what what went down? Where where are the pieces? Where is the forest that that was here? Where are the pieces of it? Where can we find evidence of what has changed physically? Um, and so, an experience that I had while doing this that book project that really stuck with me was while visiting um, this small town of small island of Vinyl Haven. Um, and in Maine, while well, I was researching quarries that had supplied a lot of um, paving stones to Manhattan in the late um, 1800s. And so granite there had really shaped, had really helped to speed the flow of capital and paving contracts and also helped to build big stone empires for quarry owners. Um, and in response to unfair working conditions there, quarry workers in Maine organized the country's first stone cutting union. And so that chapter really looks at how the, this really heavy flow of granite um, was, was disrupted by solidarity um, between quarry workers in Maine and paving layers in Manhattan and other people, you know, in other parts of the country. They were installing granite stuff. Um, and so the idea of material flows, I think sometimes it's very, it's a very seductive language. I, I'm seduced by it. Um, but it also can be very abstract. So I think 
for me is interesting to think about how it's like not abstract at all. It's actually like really heavy and people touch it and it moves through hands that can also disrupt it. Um, and so while I was visiting Vinyl Haven, I was wondering a lot about what it would feel like to have the place where you live kind of dug up and sent somewhere else. Um, and I was surprised by how present this idea was um, when I was there. Everyone I talked to was kind of talking about it, maybe because I was asking about it, but it, was, it seemed very present, um, even though the industry had really closed decade, many decades before. So I met Bill, um, who came from a family of paving cutters, and he expressed a lot of pride and kind of like interest in how there were pieces of where he lives somewhere else. Um, and there were these meticulous records detailing not just how much or how the granite was carved, but like very specifically that it went somewhere and it kind of continued to live on in a place in a certain way. And I saw displays which detailed where on the island the quarries were located. And also this map which showed that there were these horse tro granite horse troughs that had traveled from Vinyl Haven and were in like pretty much every, every state. And everyone was talking about it. Um, and so Bill and I went to stand on top of what was the Sands Quarries which, Quarry, which is one of the major quarries that had been um, sending paving stones. And we talked about all of the stone that had left there. And from there, it was possible to imagine all of the paving blocks and columns and carved eagles. There was a specialty of carved eagles um, taken from the streets, you know, of all of these institutions in Buffalo and Boston and New York and pulling them kind of back in. Like, what if you could like repack the quarry with all of that stuff? What would it look like? What would it feel like? Um, it would be kind of like this film played backwards and you'd see the, the history of construction in the 1970s century kind of like working its way backwards. So at the very bottom there would be these blocks that were cut just before the quarry closed and then halfway up would there be pieces that were cut in the late 1870s and the top would be the pieces that were cut right when the quarry opened when it was still a hill. Um, and so I had a sense from talking to people that there was something about recording of this, um, the movement of, of these elements of your home or of your land that is a kind of important part of of the loss of it and kind of knowing that it goes on. And so that really stuck with me a lot. And I think that's kind of the basis for, for the, the questions that I'm starting to ask right now. So, um, and this is Sands Quarry earlier on. So I live um, in, in Toronto on the north side of Lake Ontario. And I work in a small town called Cambridge um, on the west, which, flow, which is on the Grand River, which flows to Lake Erie. And this region is one of the densest areas in the country, and it's one of the most culturally diverse areas in the world. Um, and unlike Vinyl Haven, it's, which was a kind of export economy, this city really feels like a consumer rather than a source of, of materials. Um, but I can walk from my house to High Park, which is um, a beautiful remnant of black oak savanna that used to dominate the region. And these oaks and this whole landscape are evidence of thousands of years of indigenous caretaking and stewardship. And also a reminder of really what's changed here. Um, that in the making of this metropolis, this like huge urban region, the city was not just built on top of something, but it was actually like built from it. It came, it was the same stuff. Um, and that like Vinyl Haven, the place where I was, um, was also dug up and sold and transformed into buildings and roads that exist here today and probably also exist somewhere else, but I don't know where. Where are they? I don't know. Um, so. Um, we were told that when the British arrived in that area, it was a barely populated wilderness, but it was a forest garden um, where Mississaugas of the Credit and Anishinaabe and Wendat and Haudenosaunee people were connecting through huge, you know, with other huge populations and urban areas across the continent. And so I'm really um, grateful to people like Dr. Andrew Judge and many other people that are really like <laughs> actively working to change the story and, and tell us more about the dense cultural ecological life of this area before European contact. And the British colonial project, I think, is talked a lot about as kind of a project of erasure. Like so much was erased. There were languages erased, topographies were erased, and it's a, it's a I think, an accurate, maybe an accurate word to use. Um, but it's also it's also kind of a disappearing word. It's a, it's a word that kind of doesn't allow for, for um, <clears throat> things to go on. And so um, to live here, I think, is a, is a 
to contend with how you know, normal daily life is really a continuation of this history, um, especially in a place which is really excellent at very good feel-good stories. <laughs> we excel in that in Canada in general, I think. Um, and so Amitav Ghosh writes about how colonization and um, really was a project of ecological and, trans and topographic transformation in all of these different ways. So by claiming forest for the crown, by <clears throat> through rail building, engaging in the transatlantic slave trade, encouraging settlers to stake land and farm it um, as my Scottish relatives did and developing mining industries as my Chinese relatives arrived to work in the Rocky Mountains coal mines. And so for this project, um, I'm really interested in looking for physical presence of the land that seems to have disappeared um, and to account for what's no longer here and maybe um, to see it continuing um, as a possibly as kind of a dis in its dispersal, taking shape in a different form in different places. Um, so I'm thinking about how to try to do this. And one method of finding prevalence presence that occurs to me is to count or to account. Um, so I think about the work um, that some people are doing to try to hold the crown, the British crown and the Canadian kind of institution accountable. And I can share one example close, very close to home. So this map shows um, some of the land agreements and treaties in the area. And this skinny shape here um, is attractive land that was promised to the Six Nations of the Grand River for their use forever. But most of this land was quickly sold off by the Crown and has become a major urban area, including the place where Waterloo is, where my university is, and a tiny fraction remains in the control of the Six Nations. Um, so they've done this incredible project auditing what's owed. Like, what's if you actually paid what was owed, it would be trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars. Um, and, you know, so they, there was money loaned to build the Welland Canal. There were, there was money um, owed to build railroads to major institutions like McGill University and all of these kind of institutions that have become very wealthy and were, were literally the, the way through which wealth was built in the, in the country. And so these numbers are really you know, sharp, I think. Um, and they have reported that Canada, you know, in response, the country has admitted that they actually can't, when they, when they when asked to account, they, they say they can't account. So I think this notion of like actually counting is pretty interesting. And then another approach to, to finding presence that I'm thinking about is to see where life, how life continued, like how things traveled and continued on. Um, I've been interested in this idea of a material diaspora, which I, is a word I use very cautiously. Um, and it, diaspora means dispersal, but usually of people moving, landing, having presence, and finding belonging in another place. Um, and this is this amazing drawing by Sarah Zodi um, while working on the Valongo Wharf um, project in Rio de Janeiro, where she's drawing the overlapping movements of Africans who arrived um, enslaved in this port and the plants that people carried with them and made life out of and the context, like within the context of this lo longer term continental shift. Um, and then I think about Maria Teresa Alves's uh, Seeds of Change project where she's looking at movement, diasporas of, of kind of ballast plants. Oops, did I just turn it off? Oh, yeah. Um, unintentional movements or arrivals of plants that, that make life in different places. Um, and I'm also inspired by work being done on the rematriation of stolen items from colonial museums, like this beautiful project by um, Toronto-based artist Samir Farouk. And these really focus on pro like what's considered valuable cultural artifacts, um, which are collected by colonial museums. But I'm, I think the, the things that I'm looking at are more and are less likely to be collected. They're, they're less likely to be considered kind of valuable artifacts. Um, and I like that the word diaspora expresses that life continues, that it doesn't disappear but takes other forms no matter, no matter what the journey is. But I'm also really unsure about using this word. This is just like my honest, <laughs> honest moment, you know, you don't know. Um, because I think it has a really strong connection to forced migration, such as slavery and human experiences of it. And so I, I also think it's kind of maybe a weird overstep. So I'm just being honest in this very public environment. Um, <laughs> it's like... A, my friend told, was like, just do it. It'll be fine. So anyways, hopefully it's fine. Um, so 
I'm drafting this project and I'm starting to think about some interrelated aspects of the land that I want to look at. And I don't yet know what the criteria will be. Will it be like the, the most amount of stuff? Will it be the most profit generated? Will it be the most culturally significant? So in this first take, I'm, t I'm thinking about five different things. So river habitats where beavers shape the water flow by cutting and arranging trees. Um, mixed pine forests where people and many species live. Shale and clay beds that people have shaped into pottery for millennia as pot as, and, and later into fired brick. Um, gravel deposits that filter water at the regional scale but also become the main component of modern infrastructure like concrete. And it also, in turn, then the same infrastructure as it's demolished, it becomes landfill or reused in other structures. So a couple of these I've just hardly thought about, and a couple of them I've thought about for a little bit longer. Um, so I'm going to just kind of move through some of those early thoughts. Uh, so my friend Martha Stegman pointed out recently that this year we're hearing a lot about projects um, like this one out west by Ducks Unlimited with the Mawat. Uh, First Nation to look at reintroducing beavers into as, as artificial dams are failing and are decommissioned. And so the hope is really that <clears throat> some form of reintroduction could mediate flooding and droughts and support more species to thrive. <clears throat> this is um, from a text by Leanne Betasamasake Simpson. Um, where, <clears throat> excuse me, um, um, where she's talking about the near extinction of beaver and its status as kind of like a nuisance animal that people want to get rid of. Um, and she describes how Nishnabewin uh, oral literature represents beavers as makers of intricate landscapes for many species. And I haven't started looking at this yet, but since the project is about the changing of landscape, I think it might make sense to start with a species that's been such an incredible, incredibly powerful shaper of this region and whose exploitation was also the basis of its colonization. So beavers were, after cod, the first major colonial export, and by 1700, Canadian beaver and moose trade was part of the French Crown Corporation alongside West Indian plantations and the transatlantic slave trade. And this huge area of land, which was named after the British king's cousin Rupert, um, was until 1870 deemed the exclusive domain of the Hudson Bay Company. And the trade across the northern continent was this kind of first formal integration of indigenous and European economies. And the trade was largely driven by Victorian fashion. So at the time, top hats were becoming a huge trend for European men, and um, beaver fur was perfect, it was ideal, because beaver fur has these two different layers of um, hair. So there's this, this kind of like the outer one that you see, and then underneath there's, a, there's a, a matted one that has kind of little barbs, and it creates incredible felt. So that's, what, that's how you got this kind of beautiful, warm texture. And so the trade continues for um, 250 years, and while more, more of it was dominantly further north and east. It also passes through southern Ontario, too. And so they become, uh, beaver pelts become this first currency. And so they're calling something, uh, something is called a made beaver, which could be traded at the Hudson Bay Company store for one of these coins. And you could then trade for goods at the store. Um, my friend Pohana um, reminded me about this painting by Cree and Anglo artist Ken Monk, Kent Monkman called The King's Beavers, which really um, makes the beavers, I think, main characters in this very chaotic history. Um, so there were hundreds of thousands of beavers traded every year <clears throat> for these two and a half centuries. And as the beavers were removed, their role as land builders changed. And I'm, I'm really interested in learning more about how, how that um, trade also, like what that meant in the land. And so in this extremely quick look, I haven't seen yet any specific examples of where these beaver pelts are or beaver felt hats. Um, and I'm wondering, have they been tucked away in attics? Have they already decomposed? Have they, um, have they been passed on and shared silently? And where are they? You know, that's, that's my question. Um, <clears throat> So after the beaver trade um, diminished, timber really took its place. And I want to thank uh, Madeline Reinhardt for her uh, really helpful research on this topic. 
So I wanted to look at, um, at the white pine, which is another species that has immeasurable cultural value. For example, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy identifies the great tree of peace um, as a white pine because it has these five clustered needles uh, that symbolize the nation's coming kind of unification. And also it's a tree with incredible economic value in building colonial wealth. Um, and so by the mid 1700s, the French Navy had depleted maritime forests of pine and oak uh, that were cut for ship masts and then began to cut, um, they, they moved westward and Britain started to claim huge expanses of crown land and they marked um, large pines and oaks with this three stroke hatchet the king's broad arrow um, as property of the Royal Navy. So loggers could get licenses to cut them, but other, any other use of the trees was criminal. So you can kind of think about this trade in three phases that map perfectly onto the size of the trees in the forest. So first you're working with like giant, giant um, pines that were cut for squared timber and then smaller sawn lumber. And then by the 1900s, only smaller, qual lower quality and smaller trees were left, which were harvested for pulp and paper. <clears throat> So workers in timber camps, camps hewed um, timber by hand, and then forests of squared timber moved as raft and through timber slides um, through the Ottawa and St. Lawrence River valleys. Um, and a duty um, system made it much cheaper for Britain to get wood from colonies from, than from Northern Europe. And when Napoleon blocked Britain's access to Baltic timber, this was another surge in, in North American timber demand. So ships would bring timber to Britain and then return with settlers to do more timber and agricultural work on the way back. So I think there's this interesting um, emblem of this incredible mass of wood that was flowing, which is this ship, the Columbus. Um, so it was an innovative scheme to get as much timber to Europe at the cheapest price in the fastest way possible. So the plan was to build a cheap, and many were commenting that it was a very ugly boat um, in the colony, and it would be gigantic. It was 10 times the normal size of a boat, and it was built to be deconstructed. So you would, <clears throat> when it arrived in England, you just take it apart, and you'd sell that wood, and it, would, it was a one-time only ship. And um, you'd also like avoid some, some taxes. <laughs> it was a sneaky, and. I don't know how they slipped that through because it's pretty obvious, but um, you could you could kind of just make it was a way to maximize profit in as quick a way as possible. So this is another view of it, um, and so the boat was not cocked to save on costs, but also to allow for disassembly. And incidentally, it worked so well and was such a success, a commercial success, that they decided to gamble and go back, and it did not work. They they wrecked on the way back. Um, but I think it's just a, a kind of like emblem of what's happening at the, at the time. So as old growth um, trees and northern U.S. forests disappear, the market shifts to sawn lumber and the U.S. becomes a major um, importer. And so forests were cut to make way for roads and rail corridors, but also the, the roads and rails were actually constructed with wood. So here you can see a <clears throat> corduroy ro road of lined up logs and using <clears throat> wood for infrastructure. And then at some point, uh, plank roads take off in Ontario, and this is, and then kind of like, were later adopted in New York. Um, but they were very short lived. They could only last for at the most 10 years. And then here you can see Nicholson block pavement that was integrated into many towns. And uh, this is in Toronto. And at the same time, stone houses became wood using white pine. But they started to build with pine that could not be exported. because so, so the cities in Ontario started to be built with like substandard materials because the better bricks were going away and the better wood was going away. Um, and I think you can kind of feel it, actually. <laughs> um, and so um, by the 1880s, Ontario was almost, had almost completely exhausted its forest. And conservationist Edmund Zavitz described, you know, in, in how all of this pine had basically like floated down the rivers <clears throat> towards England. So there was a kind of, you know, century and a half of unchecked de deforestation, fire, exhaustive uh, farming practices, and kind of un unplanned settlement. And so this led to Zavitz, Zavitz to kind of claim this whole area as wasteland, so a kind of municipal burden, which, which then prompted a major reforestation campaign that, that today you can see when you go camping and you see these really tightly packed pine plantations everywhere. Um, 
so I ask myself, where are these old, where are these, where's this forest now? Um, is it in old barns, in old, in ports in the Great Lakes? Is it in British buildings? Is it in shipwrecks um, underneath pavements in northern New York, uh, upstate New York? Um, is it burned? I think the answer is yes. Um, and burned and, and cycled through the soil many times over. Um, and so as more wood went to the States, um, Ontario built with more brick, and by the 1930s, almost a third of the buildings were built in brick. And so this is Georgian Bay Shale, which is a limey deposit about 450 million years old, and people have been making pottery out of it forever. Um, and for a hundred years, this shale was kind of was extracted, ground pressed, and fired into millions of bricks that flowed into the city as brick buildings um, that dominated, that kind of continue to characterize and are kind of the identity of the city. I realize I'm talking about you know this area, but it's so it's very typical, you know, like it's not at all obviously the story of Ontario. It's the story of of many places, um, and um, so bricks really started to kind of like solidify the city in a different way. And when the city burned, um, it was rebuilt in brick. And so I haven't really started looking at this topic yet, but I think it's, it's really interesting to me that there were so many, actually, Catherine, you were talking about this today. We find that there were so many distributed clay pits and shale, kind of small neighborhood scale, um, brick kind of manufacturing, that it was this incredible, it was like a neighborhood scale um, processing. So the ultimate of local. Um, but at the same time, the fired bricks became an export economy as hundreds of thousands went to the states every year um, in the 30s and 40s. So I imagine there's going to be populations of bricks firmly in place, other locations of demolished and landfilled bricks. Um, and as De uh, Dennis Ergen and Mark Gorgoleski have accounted, they actually counted, um, there's more than 4,000 cubic meters of brick annually that's coming out of um, or that would be ready to be reused in Toronto if there was an economy of reuse, which there is not yet. Um, so in the mid-century, some of these brick neighborhoods were toppled um, by incoming concrete highways and large-scale developments. And the concrete that was seemingly generic and engineered and global was like ironically very extremely local. So this is... Um, the, you know, the region of southern Ontario, and there are these swaths of Paleozoic and Mesozoic limestone and dolostone that's drilled and blasted and crushed um, and used as road base and aggregates for concrete. concrete. And the region also has a kind of like surface um, geology of Pleistocene deposits, so sands and deposits that were left after glacial retreat, so they're compositionally diverse. Um, as the bedrock that that kind of dug that they were dragged from, um, and they might be mixed or stratified, and depending on exactly how they were laid down, that has a huge impact in terms of how profitable they are to extract. And I think we all know that sand and gravel is very important in our lives. Like we're being reminded of here, it's so ubiquitous that it's kind of possible not to think about it as land, like not to think about it as where we are, um, and and not to think about it as like a place. And so, um, but it's also very cheap and heavy and expensive to transport. So unlike many other material flows, aggregate extraction takes place really close to market um, where its impact is usually near. And so I think that's very interesting because often um, like those who are, uh, those who are affected are not the same as those who are, there's usually a bigger distance between those who are affected and those who are kind of like benefiting from a resource. So in Canada, the first concrete highway um, connected Hamilton and Toronto in 1917. And by the 60s, again, very typical, typical history here, um, there is a major network of expressways surrounding the city, including the Gardner Expressway and the 12-lane Highway 401 um, that were designed to bypass the city. And these routes, you know, were no longer following existing roads, but cut, um, cut new ways through the land. And they were producing large land intensive development parcels which were subsidized by the province. So highway construction brought this kind of sprawling development but at the same time expanded pits and quarries throughout the region. And this map shows, you know, the, the overlay between the deposits and then in the little red dots are the, are the different um, contractors, the gravel operators and pits. 
And at the time, there was so much construction going on that there was a, there was starting to be a bit of a crisis about available about you know source and availability. And so, this is a accompanying report that I think is a very beautiful description of the diversity of of the these deposits. Um, and so, it was for it was for a kind of like economic report about about how much was there at the time. Um, so. The report for Highway 401 show, says that there's like really we we don't have enough. Um, we're having problems with finding sources, and but one place that was available or was available and was like suitable was this place, which was the aggregate quarry um, close to Milton, which was um, which sits on the Niagara escarpment. So this really long continuous escarpment that extends to the Georgian Bay. You can see it here. Um, and there was a fateful blast. They they decided they needed to cut a road and cut through the face of the and, and did a blast through the face the face of the escarpment, which you can see here. Um, and this explosion was uh, really significant. It triggered a, a, a conservation and planning commission and a planning act, and it's a kind of crystallized example of this these kind of conflicts that surround aggregate extraction. I think everywhere, but especially when you're kind of overlaid with um, prime agriculture in a super, you know, intense urban region. So the other infrastructure um, showpiece was the Gardner Expressway. This is in partial construction in 1963, and it's now been partially deconstructed, um, and politicians for decades have been talking about whether to take it down. And there are these technical studies which suggest that the, the structure's rapid deterioration is a function of different, a whole range of different types of aggregate sources and concrete mixes. And so this is a fact that the aggregate industry uses to argue for less constrained extraction. And this is a project um, that was installed last year underneath in, a, in the Bentway Park by the Ogima Mekana project called Waweni Bizindan, which means listen carefully in Anishinaabe language. And I heard the artist Susan Blight describe how she watched um, engineers put on stethoscopes and like listen to the, to the bents to listen for salt running through it, which was the kind of way that they're trying to understand like how degraded the, the or how, you know, this, the health of this, of this structure. Um, and so the artists write it that their project thinks about the concrete and the built environment as a relative um, and using, using Anishinaabe lang language to animate the supposedly inanimate infrastructure. This is a, an example of, of how the gravel industry leans heavily on the story of, of aggregate being a local material, so promoting the low transportation carbon footprint, the potential of restoration um, of former quarries, and emphasizing that it's a temporary land use. Um, but at the same time, activists' uh, campaigns are also leveraging, leveraging this kind of local story in a really different way. So here, visualizing the volume of 25 years of Toronto's aggregate consumption directly onto the city for scale, and rejecting the building of a new highway, citing, among, among other things, the unnecessary extraction involved. And this is a, um, a Gra reform gravel mining coalitions um, demanding a moratorium, calling for gravel licenses to be stopped at until a third party study is conducted with indigenous parties, affected communities, and scientists. So for this flow, um, I'm interested in how this dispersal is really concentrated and local, and at the same time totally, see, or to me at least, like very invisible, um, down in infrastructures that don't seem to be of a place at all, but they very much are. And then finally, um, as this infrastructure and all the buildings are demolished, that becomes this other material flow um, through obsolescence or planning decisions or shifts in what's valued, um, whether that's economically or culturally. And this work comes from a... Um, from a collaboration with the with the Toronto-based researcher Alison Kriba, that of her her company is called Local Technique, and she researches and kind of promotes deconstruction practices. Very interesting work, um, and we have been looking at this moment, really recent moment in the city when buildings started to be demolished instead of being taken apart by hand for um, for salvage for material salvage, which is like very recent 
uh, shockingly recent. Um, and while salvage yards were distributed around the city, um, you know, forever, by the 1960s, large brick neighborhoods came down in campaigns of urban renewal. And with this takedown, this, there was a kind of whole new mass, massive waste stream that was produced. Um, and so the salvage and wrecking industry kind of pivoted towards a different way of working with it, which was to demolish it and kind of use it as landfill. So all of a sudden there was land, there was landfill to fill land. Um, and so Jennifer Foster and Heidi Schaff are two people who have been, I think, in a beautiful way animating this, how these generations of demo, demolished buildings have been dumped as landfill on the Leslie Street spit. First wood and then brick and then concrete and sidewalks and rebar and, um, and this new kind of non-stop waste stream became also a really important for the city an economic um, driver for, for new real estate on the, on the city waterfront. And so parks like Ontario Place and other types of waterfront par um, parks have really also been used to kind of like have, have shared different ideas about the landscape from being a dump to being modern exhibition to being kind of ecological parks and, and um, habitats. And in some places that debris um, supports a lot of new life. And so um, I'm really inspired by the work. There's so many people that I know that are related to um, architecture and landscape architecture that are really trying to think about this material flow and, and trying, to, trying to pressure the city to, to think about demolition, how demolition works and how, like, what could possibly incentivize um, better deconstruction practices. So I think this is really exciting and it's so much a bigger question about what's valued. So I have, I, I guess I think with this, pro or my, one of my interests is, in thinking about how it is that we value things, like how, you know, is it partly um, this sense, this kind of intense disconnection from an understanding of where it came, of, of, of what went into it, or that it is actually the same place that we are? Um, these are these are the questions that I have. So I'm at a stage of, of a lot of really broad, earnest questions. Um, and I think like I'm, I'm sharing some anecdotes from around Toronto, but I'm, I'm um, and then some from much further away. So I'm really also trying to think about how I'm gonna frame this, like what is the place? I think it's kind of important that I'm, I, I wanna be looking at a region, but how to, what is that region or how to, how to define that? Um, and I think it would be interesting if it was not only a kind of colonial or political boundary, like maybe an ecological boundary or not sure. And I think I also need to find a ways to consult or work with people who can speak to, I think my interest is in understanding cultural values. Um, and so I think I need to find a way to, to speak with people who can, can share different cultural significances of this land. Um, and so I really want to be asking, you know, it, as I go into this research, what forces were motivating these movements? Where did the materials go? What role did they play where they landed? Are they still there now? And how are they valued, remembered, or, or forgotten? So I'll end there. Thanks so much for listening. Once it starts, there'll be lots. Oh, yeah. Someone has to go first. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I've been a big fan of your work for a while, uh, or at least in starting school here. Um, and I feel like there's, in a couple of the classes that I've taken and people I've talked to in other departments and other disciplines, there's kind of this, I don't know if it's a, a very recent thing, but it sounds recent to me, but like the material turn for things. So um, even things such as like ancient history that like material and the landscape turn are like, there's more focus on these things of how landscapes and materials shape us and have shaped us. And there's something that's really interesting in kind of in the stuff that you're exploring of like material gene genealogies almost. And there's like kind of forensic take on it. Um, so I'm wondering, for you, like what that research into like the signatures of materials looks like. Uh, you're talking to to kind of trace these things, and then how are you tracing? Like how do you know? 
How do you know? Yeah, yeah good question. I don't know. <laughs> how do you know? How do you know what? Or how do you know yeah. that materials are coming from certain? Places, oh yeah, yeah, like yeah. Actual material yeah. signatures. Or yeah. The, the labor signatures. Yeah. Or actual signatures. By and by signatures, you mean like evident, like kind of knowable evidence. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for the question. Um, I think it's a funny, I think maybe anyone's research project is like funny, like it's got its own peculiarities, but I think with this one, it's it ends up being, or it has for me been, um, in some cases, like looking for things that absolutely no one wants to, like, like a connection, like for the Reciprocal Landscapes Project, for example, there, there is a chapter about steel, and I, I spent like more time on that than any than anyone, and I could not find like any definitive answer about like where the steel came from for this for the park and for Riverside Park, um, and like tried so hard in so many different ways, and I like in the end I, it was really just based on um, a few. There's a few like. Uh, hopeful bridges maybe like may, this seems like a possibility possibility so there were there were in fact like no clear answers but I think it was what I what I came to was that the it's a bit for the it's a bit like necessary for me as like my the design trope or the the design of the project trope like for me it's really important to say that it was exactly this to that but it doesn't really matter like like it it does but it doesn't it, it doesn't it's not consequential like it's kind of more the point is that it's like i'm interested in doing it because it kind of shows these bigger bigger things that are happening in the world but yeah it kind of i guess i would say sometimes i don't know uh sometimes um I don't know, I guess it's about like just trying very, very many different types of different types of materials, whether that's like advertisements or sometimes it's literate, like sometimes it's in somebody's book or, you know, like a, a novel or something like that, like just kind of un, unexpected places where people might be where these things mattered. And I would say it's never, it's always like a surprise. And maybe that's what's fun. It feels very detective-y, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you again. Uh, one thing I'm curious about on the topic of material scarcity, just looking, I, I guess when I think of Toronto today, I think of the, one of the past New York City's problems with, her, with new demand for new material, and especially trying to now go for more sustainability based material. Is there this new crisis of scarcity now that is impacting the way that I mean, both structures and landscapes are being? Designed and built today in the Toronto region. In the Toronto region specifically? Yeah, just refer to me. You know, I I can't say I I know I don't have any like very specific response to that. I I think so in general. I think that like in to speak very generally, I think there is lots of concern about how the current system of building is going to work because maybe maybe it's most felt in terms of cost, right? It's like we can't do that in the same way. But it's a good question and. I'm curious about that. Um, I just happened to watch on Tuesday the launch of um, Mailing Loco and Anna Dyson's report. Did anybody see this on building materials and climate change? I think that's a great report. I'm excited to read it. I just heard them um, talk about it. Um, but they're, I think it, it's, it's very much a kind of like literature study of that, um, that question in general. So, yeah. I imagine, does anyone, does anyone know? That Anyone have thoughts about that? I would love to hear them. Hi. Hi. You too. <laughs> so good seeing you. Good seeing like right, you know, I love the work in person and also from afar. So I'm really happy that you're able to talk about this. So I'm just thinking there's there's times when you show up in my mind because I'll read reports like um, recently um, people talking about the, the craze for electric cars and how incidentally it means we're now dependent on lithium for cars in addition to fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And I, I bring that one up because when I think about it, I was like, I wonder how this could reach a broader audience, this type of knowledge or sensitivity if designers were the ones coming up with these things. And when I see your work, I see how in landscape now there's this new sensitivity or a set of techniques or methods for, for tracing the materials. I'm just wondering how you feel about um, your approach and your technique 
uh, becoming something that designers might use to inspect other industries or other other fields that are also dependent on materials? Is that something that you use? Thanks. Um, <laughs> uh, I've never thought of that. I guess I'm not sure. Like, do you mean do you mean connect? Because connecting to other like what kinds of I mean, like, so right mm -hmm. now the people who sort of deal with these topics are usually journalists. So yeah. Yeah. Even more arcane would be geographers who are talking to each other. Um, but because uh, because landscape architects mm -hmm. who draw things in captivating ways have to um, in many cases communicate with mm -hmm. the people the public. Yeah. Um, that there's a whole set of material flows that when I encounter stories about them, I actually think of you and it's like I'm wondering if, if Jane is also curious about these things. And do you, do you imagine that that's part of the thing that discipline could offer the broad? I world? totally think so. That's a very leading question because I think <laughs> I'm you. I'm trying to be generous. I know, no, no, <laughs> because because um, I mean, I'd love to hear you say more about that because I think that's such a beautiful like that. Is, I think that's very true. Actually, we were talking about this a little bit today too. It's like, what is the like the the attention of of like how people feel and see and understand history is so like there's nothing more powerful than than understanding land or like understanding the place where you are and so I think no matter what yeah I mean I guess I really do think landscape architecture is about that like that's like there are lots of other people who can do other things but um but to be able to like communicate connection that's pretty profound like to to because I guess for me, a lot of this, if I really boil it down, I think it's like pretty basic. It's like I feel this. I feel a little bit um, like I want to understand better where I where I am. I want to like actually feel like I'm in an ecosystem. I want to actually feel like like I'm surrounded by that. I have a connection to land, and it, we've been talking about. I think with with kind of like greater understanding about colonial history and and land acknowledgments and all of this. I think there's this word land is like has a real presence right now. And, but yet in my mind, it's, I'm always like, what is that land? You know, like what it feels, it, feel, it can feel very distant. So I do, I, yeah, I really think this field of people who are, who are like actively kind of working with land as medium, but also like in ways that communicate, I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty powerful. Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Shreya. Uh, as someone who's just starting out and discovering what my practice could be, um, what I'm curious to know is what made you interested in studying materials? Like, what made you want to take a second look at something that I think we end up blindsiding a lot? So, what was Yeah, it was to totally working. It was like specifying materials and specifying, like, what are these deck boards going to be? What's the stone paving going to be? And um, really like lo loving that or kind of like loving construction and loving um, seeing the things coming together and being like, hey, what, you know, what is, you know, any palette of material? Actually, it's that, that, you know, that, that moment when you're with a client, and you've got all the, the palette. Um, but just seeing that as like, wait a minute, this is like an interesting combination of characters from like all over the world. And how are you made? And kind of just being really curious about that, but then also never having, there's never time to do that. And also, yeah, I think maybe like research just offers you this extra, extra time to ask questions that, that, you, that are hard to do in practice. So yeah, it was very, very practical. Like I just wanted to know more about, especially because I think they're counterintuitive. I think I also was, was finding um, there was like often a conflict between like, hey, this is what this is what we're here for. This is how we want to make this thing. But then the materials that we're using have these other problems. And I, I don't think it's easy. Like I don't, I don't think, um, I think it's much easier to write about than it is to actually make those decisions. Like honestly, I, I think it's very difficult because all of the you know the industries are very entrenched and there, and there's clients and there's you know decisions to be made and and value engineering all that kind of stuff so um yeah it was it, but it comes it comes from that from that from like under being in that position thanks for the question hi yeah, hi On the 
Whenever anyone asks a question, I'm like, I just want to know what you, like, that sounds so interesting. I would love to know what you think about that. But um, uh, I guess maybe in just in terms of writing, I find it, um, I find it like energizing to kind of jump or like to see, maybe that's also what I really like about, about like the subject matter of materials because is, is that they're changing like that that they are not, they are not only one thing. So I guess I find when that, that by jumping scales or seeing the brick as the clay, it, it like releases a whole bunch of, of like tension in my brain. You know, it's just like, oh, okay, we can like see that in a slightly different way. So I think for me, the, the jumping of scales just helps to open open a way of seeing things maybe it's like a just a yeah a technique to to fill out something that seems a little too fixed or something yeah um, all right um one thing i was thinking quite a bit about during your talk was um this idea of like cultural keystone species, um, you know, sort of thinking about it through like an ethnobotanical lens or something, um, and how then a lot of these materials, which are fabricated and produced and machinated to become something else from their original source, in some ways are like, right, our, our version of, you know, sort of ethnobotany, but through a sort of colonial separate lens. Um, so just a comment in terms of, I don't know, Chad, if there's any potential threads there as far as like source material and how people might have um, initially for millennia worked with some of these products that have now been transformed into other things. I mean, obviously wood or timber is mm -hmm. a very obvious mm -hmm. one, right? But um, in terms of concrete or aggregate and that kind of thing. Um, but also, the other thing that I was thinking about, maybe this piggybacks a bit on what Molly was talking about, is um, sort of that notion of like where where do the stories unfold, mm -hmm. and how does that kind of like coincide with a potential idea about landscapes of care? And in Toronto, let's say, like what is that sort of outer extent of borderlands where? Um, where it's hard to make those stories connect to place and to the materiality and um, you know where it, does that then focus our attention back into kind of a more localized or regional landscape of care so I wonder I mean I know some people are doing like um, Doug who was from our fellow last year was kind of working on that notion of like how do landscapes of care and this is conceptual idea about that, how does that term or that idea potentially change depending on the materiality, depending on the place, mm. depending on the material flow or, um, or wildlife corridors? Right. What does it mean, landscapes of care? That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like it. Like, oh, yeah. I think in the most basic yeah. way, mm. like, um, uh, land that sort of adhere to or mm -hmm. tie into in terms of mm -hmm. caretaking and stewardship. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, what you said was very interesting to me in all kinds of ways, but I, I guess um, um, maybe it just made me think that no matter what, you know, that people are caring about <laughs> what they do, yeah. right? Or like it's not it's I think maybe some maybe in some ways because this is so so early it's like not quite nuanced enough like there's a lot I think there's with any of these extraction contexts there's like a lot of perspectives that are all like valid in different ways um and so I think 
yeah, maybe landscapes of care could be applied in any, that, that, that idea could be applied in any context, maybe. I don't know. That's what comes to mind. Hi, my name's Cleo. Hi. My first year Hi. Um, landscape architecture. So thank you very much for sharing, sharing those stories. I'm curious about um, how you think about the value of material changing and what that, how that informs where the material goes. So like a project uses stone from a particular batch from a quarry, but you have leftover and it can't be used in another, you know, it can't be like mixed with another batch. Um, so that value has changed to like the same material um, or like cobblestones being used as ballast and then being used in streets. So I'm curious if you, in your research of those like inflection points of Material changing value has sort of been an indicator for that material. That's so interesting, and I, that's something I really I know I'm interested in that. I can't say I'm trying to think about examples, but I guess maybe like the the stuff that's coming out of that's being demolished right now, I think is a good example. It's like it's unbelievable what's getting what's getting torn down especially now when we're realizing like how expensive that stuff is and all that went into it so i think that's a big that question is something that i'm really asking for myself um so yeah <laughs> i think that's what it's a lot about yeah yeah because that's determined by you know, that's determining policy and all that kind of stuff yeah maybe one more question and then we'll oh yeah go. Go. then we have that. yeah Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so so, on a, so as a reader of your work, I feel like I've talked to many people who have similar experience. The, the vignettes that you craft are deeply pleasurable, I think, for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. to it's really satisfying to kind of follow a journey between a material object, you know, its occupation, back to a landscape, the historical unveiling of it. My question for some of your previous work for this new project and formation is, do you, do you ever worry that that kind of romantic storytelling really obfuscates the actual reality of construction and the way in which we have built and perpetuated systems of commodifying materials where most designers do not know where their materials come from um, intentionally and the construction industry does so um, and kind of then how do you situate this experience then that folks often have reading your work of feeling like there are these like mm. clear and lovely connections mm -hmm. And I realize the work you do is primarily historical, but I guess the second half of that question mm -hmm. is, what relationship do you want designers to have with materials? Mm. Yeah, I mean, let's see. Um, I would love to talk more about this, <laughs> um, but I guess I, I guess I don't, like I want to tell that story because I, don't think uh, I didn't know those things, you know. Like I kind of just they're they're just examples of things to. For me, they're just like something to hold on to to like remember that there is a connection. I don't think they they don't release any of the reality. Like if anything, I I hope that like my intention is to not release any of the like the the horror or like the 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 the. the the violence of those of many of those contexts, um, but it's a good. I mean, I'll just say that's a great question. I'm gonna think about it some more. Well, yeah. Like, should we just guess? Should we guess? Yeah. Does it matter to you that we don't actually know where materials come from? Oh no, I like, think it's we? no. I hope we all get to know more. That's the whole okay. right. I don't. Don't we all just want to know more about that? We want to. I think the thing is, is that it's it's so it's just so deep like it's so it's so difficult and we need to find ways to know more yeah absolutely yeah thank you so much thank you all so much